Many times in the history of our civilization, the introduction of a new thought has brought skepticism, even ridicule. Despite this, there always has remained the duty and an alienable right to tell the people the truth. The motion picture you are about to see is true. It is not fiction. Much of the information in it has never been told. You will see it here for the first time. On July 29, 1952, at the Pentagon, a press conference was held. This is the actual official transcript of that conference. Among those participating were Major General Roger M. Ramey, Director of Operations, USAF, Colonel Donald L. Bauer, Technical Analysis Division, Air Technical Intelligence Center, and Captain Edward J. Ruppelt, Aerial Phenomenon Branch, Air Technical Intelligence Center. This is Major General John A. Samford, Director of Intelligence, United States Air Force, who conducted the conference. Why was the conference held? It all began with an incident which occurred in 1947. On the afternoon of June 24th of that year, Kenneth Arnold made the first report on flying saucers. On this day, Arnold took off from Chehalis, Washington and flew toward the Rainier Plateau at an elevation between 9 and 10,000 feet. Over Mineral, Washington, he observed a formation of very bright objects to the north. He radioed ahead that they appeared to be close to the mountaintops and traveling at tremendous speed. When Arnold came in for a landing at Pendleton, airport personnel and the local press were waiting for him. Arnold counted nine objects in echelon formation. He observed that they had no tails and described them as saucer-shaped objects. The story was picked up by the wire services. He saw what? In the next 24 hours, virtually every newspaper in the country ran the story. report precipitated an avalanche of sightings from cities, towns, villages, from every section of the country. The commercial aspects of the saucer situation were not overlooked. Alert businessmen and manufacturers came up with all sorts of oddities the practical joker moved in. Homemade saucers of all kinds and descriptions began to turn up promiscuously. Within a few months of the original saucer report, practically everyone in America was conscious of flying saucers. This man in the saucer, can you describe him? Well, sir, he was small and skinny. He had a, his head was pointed, came to a very sharp point. He had long green hair. His eyes were a sort of purplish red. He had large ears which were formed like an antenna. His teeth were perfect, but uh, spread far apart. And I noticed, too, a jacket of uh, some sort of spun glass and bright red metallic hues. You say this all took place in a few seconds. Mr. Nagelschmidt, can you tell me what color tie I'm wearing? I'm sorry, sir. I didn't notice. You mean to say you can remember everything about this man from the spaceship, his hair, the color of his eyes, the clothing he was wearing, and yet, after all this time, you can't tell me the color of my tie? But you didn't come out of a flying saucer. Then, at approximately 1400 on January 7th, 1948, the Kentucky State Police reported to the Fort Knox Military Police that they had sighted an unusual aircraft or object flying through the air, circular in appearance, approximately 200 to 300 feet in diameter, moving westward. A Provo Marshal at Fort Knox called the commanding officer at Godman Air Force Base. How 
all flight service at Wright Field to determine if they have any experimental aircraft in our area. We have a report of an unidentified aircraft south of the field. It was about 1315 when the tower controller in the Godman Tower received his instructions from the commanding officer. All right, Patterson. The PFC continued giving routine instructions to a light plane which was practicing takeoffs and landings. Flight service. Captain Hopper, flight service. Flight service is a clearinghouse. The positions of all military planes are carefully plotted so a minute to minute check may be made on their position, course, altitude, and speed. Flight service to Godman Tower. We have no experimental aircraft in that area. However, we do have a B-29 and an A-26 on photo mission in that area. In the meantime, Lieutenant Cowan, the AACS, and the operations officer had arrived in the tower. They were joined by the intelligence officer and the executive officer. Upon hearing the information from flight service, the executive officer called Colonel Hicks, the commanding officer. At about 1350, the tower controller saw an object south of Godman Field and directed it to the attention of the tower. Lieutenant Cowan was the first of the group, after the tower controller, to locate it. He immediately directed it to the attention of the operations officer. After observing it for a moment, he picked up a telephone and put in a second call to the commanding officer. While he was putting the call through, Colonel Hicks arrived in the tower. It was now about 1420. About 1430, a flight of four F-51s being ferried from Marietta, Georgia to Stanford Field, Kentucky, was sighted south of the base. The commanding officer issued an order to contact the flight leader. Tom, plan will be and find out who's leading the flight. Godman Tower to leader, flight 451. Godman Tower to leader, flight 451. Come in. Stand by for further instructions. Look to the flight into the area of the unknown. Vector man tower on a heading of 210 degrees. Godman Tower to Captain Mantell. Come in, over. Mantell to Godman Tower. Over. Godman Tower to Captain Mantell. Investigate an unidentified object in your area. Your new course, 210 degrees. 210 degrees. Mantel to Godman Tower, changing heading to 210. Loco, out. One of the ships in Mantel's formation, NG-336, piloted by Lieutenant Hendricks, requested permission to land at Stanford Field to refuel and get oxygen. Permission was granted. Captain Mantel and the other two planes started to climb toward the object. The second pilot made a similar request. Both wingmen refueled and, after getting oxygen equipment, took off again. Captain Mantell, flying NG-3869, continued climbing, outdistancing his wingmen. At 14.45, Mantell called the tower. Mantell to tower. I see it. Above and ahead of me. I'm still climbing. A few moments later, one of Mantell's wingmen was hurt. What the hell are we looking for? After a moment, Captain Mantell made a reply. Mantell, the tower. The object is directly ahead of and above me, now moving at half my speed. Godman Tower to leader, flight 451. Godman Tower to leader, flight 451. Come in. Mantell, the tower. It appears to be a metallic object of tremendous size. The object now was in visual view of the tower personnel. Mantell, the tower. I'm trying to close in for a better look. I'll go to 20,000 feet. Shortly after this, Pilot Hammond, the remaining wingman with Mantell, called Mantell over his radio. Level off, Captain, until I've regained visual contact. The personnel in Godman Tower waited tensely for Mantell's reply, but he made no answer. A moment later, Pilot Hammond made another report to the tower. Mantell seemed to have disappeared. Mantell had apparently climbed beyond his wingman. At 15.25, the remaining wingman broke off and returned to Stanford Field. 
The object, which was in visual sight from the tower, as were the F-51s during the chase, disappeared at approximately 1550. The F-51s were first lost to view, and then the object went behind a cloud. Bradwin Tower to Captain Mantell. Come in. Over. This is Bradwin Tower to Captain Mantell. Come in. Over. At 1750, Staniford advised Godman Tower that Mantell had crashed five miles southwest of Franklin, Kentucky. The crash had occurred at approximately 1645. Captain Mantell was killed. Statements were taken from all who were present in the tower during the Mantell sighting. The tower controller stated, It looked silver or metallic. The intelligence officer? It appeared to be a bright silver object. The executive officer? It was circular in shape. The AACS? A small white object in the sky. The operations officer? It appeared round and white. The commanding officer? be seen plainly with the naked eye. The statements were typed up for the necessary signatures as the interrogation concluded. There was one point on which there was some disagreement. Not everyone who had been present in the tower had heard Mantell when he reported over the radio that he was moving in for a better look. The more lurid sections of the press reported that fragments of Mantell's plane were found to be radioactive. Some news sources reported that an autopsy revealed that Mantell had been killed by some kind of death ray unknown to our men of science. These reports were false. Because certain publications persisted in using a sensational approach in reporting sightings, there were increasing demands from the public for an explanation. However, the Air Force had already taken official cognizance of the flying disks. Headquarters, United States Air Forces issued a directive for a detailed study of flying disc reports. This project received a secret classification and the code name of SIGN. Department of Air Force and Department of Army letters directed all respective subordinate units to report directly to Air Materiel Command all information concerning unidentified flying objects. And so Project SIGN was implemented. Trained investigators were dispatched to the exact scenes of the sightings. After thorough on-the-spot interrogations, the reports were sent on to ATIC for further analysis. Utah, Washington, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, South Korea, Ohio, New Jersey, Oregon, Philippine Island, Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee, Kansas, Massachusetts. As an example of the credible type of sightings reported by reputable, trained observers was the report of Captain Willis Sperry. What is your full name, Captain? Captain Willis Sperry. How long with American Airlines? 17 years. Well, what was the date of sighting? May the 29th, 1950. And the time of sighting? 9.30 in the evening. The origin of sighting? 60 miles southwest of Washington, D.C. And the destination? Nashville, Tennessee. What was the visibility? It was unlimited. What was your altitude? 7,500 feet. Who of the crew first saw the object? A co-pilot called it to my attention as I had turned to reach for a map. The object was flying head-on at us. It was 50 times the magnitude of the brightest star. I immediately made an abrupt turn to avoid collision. As I looked to my left, the object appeared to come to a stop. Can you describe the shape of the object? It appeared as a perfectly streamlined object without wings or tail section, as it was silhouetted against the full moon. At all times, it had a brilliant, shimmering blue light in the nose. It was traveling at fantastic speed, and although it had passed off our left wing tip, it circled us in a matter of seconds and appeared off our right wing. There again, it stopped, and we watched it for several seconds. When again it started, it reversed its direction. We watched it for several more seconds until it disappeared in the east out of sight. 
Have you ever seen any other similar object, Captain? Never before or since. On January 9th, 1950, the press reported that Project Sign was closed. From now on, the Air Force stated its only similar activity would be the routine conventional watch for unidentified flying objects. This is the Daily News building in Dayton, Ohio. My name is Al Chop. A short time after my discharge from the Marine Corps, I paid a visit to the newspaper where I had previously worked as a reporter for five years. Well, Al, you rascal. Glad to see you. Good to see you. Yourself. The editor was a close friend, and he tried to convince me to take back my old job on the paper. He was very persuasive, but for personal reasons, it didn't interest me. Oh, but you remember the old days here. Now it's all different. Three hours for lunch, double time for overtime, blind copy girls. Once he realized that my mind was made up, he made another suggestion. It was due to this casual suggestion that I walked right into the middle of the flying saucer story. Ever since the Korean situation, there's a lot of activity out at Air Material Command. You could fit right in that public information office there. Uh, who's the man to see out there? Friend of mine, Major Cross. I'll call him now. The idea appealed to me. I'd always been intensely interested in aviation. Also, I liked the idea of settling down in Dayton again. Both Dee, my wife, and I had a lot of friends there. It would be like coming home again. The editor set up an appointment for me at Air Materiel Command. This is what I wanted, but a man never knows what he's getting into. The next day, I went out to AMC and talked to the Major. He seemed satisfied with my newspaper background. I was interviewed by a personnel official who filled out the necessary papers preliminary to an Air Force security check. Full name, Albert M. Chop, C-H-O-P. Age? 35. Married? Wife's name? Dolores. Children? Girl, age 11, boy 5. Take this to room D. Thank you. Shortly after, I went on the AMC payroll on the PIO desk. I soon shook down into the routine of the public information desk. There was a wide diversification of projects for which I wrote material. Most of it was released as newspaper copy with an occasional article published in the magazines. I wrote a piece on a portable printing press that could be set up close to the front line. These presses printed daily bulletins, which proved of great value in sustaining morale of frontline troops. I did a few pieces on helicopters, which were coming into wide use in Korea. Newsweek magazine printed this, and it also appeared in many of the country's leading newspapers. Then, one morning about 10 o'clock, I got a call from a newspaper editor in Boston. The Boston editor wanted confirmation, or official information, on a flying saucer report out of Sioux City, Iowa. I told the editor that Project Sign had been officially closed. He was insistent, so finally I called Air Technical Intelligence Center. No, Chop, we have no report on Sioux City or any other sighting. You people on PIO desk ought to know we've closed Project Sign. For the next couple of hours, calls came in from newspapers all over America. Gradually, I was able to piece the story together. On the previous evening, a commercial airline DC-3 in Sioux City, Iowa, had requested clearance from the tower to take off. The tower held them up, informing the pilot that there was a light in the west that they thought might be a light plane. The tower stated that they were trying to contact it, but were unsuccessful. The tower was in contact with another light plane that was coming in for a landing. The DC-3, engines idling, stood by at the end of the runway until the light plane landed and taxied off the strip. The tower then gave the DC-3 pilot permission to take off. As the DC-3 
63 climbed for altitude, an unidentified light suddenly closed in. This was the object that the tower unsuccessfully had tried to contact by radio. The tower observed this and radioed the DC-3, but the light had already been observed by both the pilot and co-pilot. Suddenly, the light accelerated and made a head-on pass at the plane, which swerved to avoid a collision. It zoomed past them, close to their wingtip. The pilot called the tower and described the object as a B-36 without wings. After being observed by several passengers, the object suddenly zoomed straight up and disappeared. About noon, two reporters came in asking for information on the Sioux City sighting. What's new on this saucer story, Al? We have nothing on it. Project sign is closed. ATIC is no longer investigating these things. How stupid can they get? How can they drop an investigation when there are things going on like this Sioux City incident? Look, George, I don't make policy around here. I've got a job, and I take my order just like everybody else. They insisted I make another call for verification with ATIC. I indicated to one of the reporters to pick up the extension and listen in, so he too could hear. Yeah, hello, Major. Al Chop. A couple of reporters here want some information on Sioux City. Look, Al, the answer is the same. The project is closed. I told you that before. Yeah, thanks, Major. You heard the man. This thing doesn't add up. Those men saw something up there. Oh, there's probably some simple explanation for it. Don't tell me you guys believe this saucer bunk. You're just sitting on a story, Al. Well, you believe what you like. But personally, I think this whole saucer business is pure, unadulterated bunk. One day, shortly after the Sioux City incident, I went over to get a story on a former German scientist. Area B was a maximum security section. The story appeared in the New York Times. I had obtained the background on the scientists from the files. He was formerly one of the top men at Pinamund, Germany, one of the key figures participating in the successful development of the V-2 rocket. This scientist had succeeded in developing a 98.8% pure aluminum oxide. These crucibles were vital to our nation's defense. They were used to melt super hard metals needed to build turbine blades for our jet aircraft. Uh, tell me, young man, <clears throat> What new reports are you getting on unidentified flying objects? Flying saucers? Oh, they keep coming in every once in a while, but we don't take them too seriously. Oh, no? Of course not. It must be amusing to a man in your line of work to hear about all these screwball reports. It is my firm opinion that these sightings should be investigated most meticulously. You don't believe that these flying saucers actually exist, do you? And how can you be so certain they don't, Mr. Chop? Well, I, I just don't believe it. Our minds should be open on all subjects. Wrong conclusions are usually the result of lack of comprehensive analysis. Of course. Well, thank you, Doctor. I won't take up any more of your time. And I'll let you read the article before I send it in. Thank you, Mr. Chop. I'll be looking forward to it. Later that same day, I paid a visit to the public information officer for Air Materiel Command. It was his job to know everything that was going on. I brought up my interview with the scientist. He's a top man, isn't he, Colonel? As good as they come. We got on the subject of saucers. He seemed to lend credence to their existence. At least he doesn't deny it. Well, he's not alone in that opinion. I don't understand, Colonel. If a crack scientist thinks they could exist, why not the Air Force? Al, I'm gonna let you in on something. Somehow security was breached on the code name sign. Every news agency knew that Project Sign meant saucers. On top of it, we were up to our bustle in screwball reports. Serious investigation was all fouled up a serious investigation. Then the Air Force is still investigating these sightings? We switched the code name to Project Grudge, and the investigations continued. And what have they shown? Nothing conclusive as yet. Could these saucers be some kind of a secret weapon of ours? No. If they were, Air Material Command would be the first to know. How about a device from a foreign country? We know they're not. What is your opinion, Colonel? I don't have any opinion, Al. 
A short time later, I was promoted to chief of the press section. From then on, there wasn't a moment when I didn't have at least one reporter hounding me for information on saucer sightings. Got a question, Al. Boys down at the office would like an honest answer. Project sign is closed, right? That's right. Has the Air Force set up a new saucer investigation? No. Thanks, Al. That's all I want to know. Coming here right away, Al. Bring pencil and paper. Line three. Colonel Goddard's on the phone. He's got a hot UFO report. I want you to listen in on it. Okay, Colonel, shoot. Colonel Goddard, chief of the Air Force Photo Reconnaissance Laboratories, reported that three of his men flying a B-29 were tracking a weather balloon over Georgia. Suddenly, an unidentified flying object appeared and flew alongside the balloon. After a few moments, the object dived and made a pass at the balloon, then proceeded to disappear. When the balloon was recovered, it had a six-foot rent in it. Colonel Goddard's men believed this unidentified flying object made the tear in the balloon. Goddard vouched for his men making the report, stating that they were highly experienced and reliable Air Force personnel. Thank you, Colonel. Think it could be a lightning bolt? Goddard wouldn't call about a lightning bolt. Didn't any of his men have a camera? No, they were tracking it with binoculars. That's something I don't get, Colonel. Wouldn't you think that somebody somewhere would have shot a picture of one of these things? Oh, we've got plenty of photographs. But the trouble with still pictures is they're too easily faked. What about a motion picture? Could that be faked? Oh, trick shots are possible, but not without complicated and expensive laboratory equipment, highly skilled men. Even then, motion picture experts could easily determine fakes. That eliminates some joker faking a piece of motion picture film in his garage. Be practically impossible to get away with that. Well, I guess that's why you have no movies of them, Colonel. As chief of the press desk, my work hours, my meals, my sleep became increasingly disturbed and chaotic. I saw little of my wife and children. Chip, my son, was at this time making periodic visits to a doctor in Dayton. How's Chip? I feel more hopeful with a new specialist. You look tired. Since you've gotten this new job, the children don't know their own father anymore. Yeah, sometimes I wish I were back on the newspaper. I was talking with Mrs. Collins today. She tells me her husband's cousin works with a man who swears he saw a flying saucer. Uh-uh. I thought I told you that term was taboo in this house. Do you really think they might be from Mars or someplace? Look, honey, don't you get like the rest of those screwballs that I have in my hair all day. Every time some kid flies a kite, 50 different people see spaceships. Come on, let's get to bed. A few days later, the Colonel and I were talking over routine press releases on a new type transport plane, when suddenly the Colonel veered off at a tangent. By the way, there's a magazine fellow coming out here from New York to do a story. I want you to set up appointments with the people he'll want to see. Right, what magazine is he representing? Life. What are they after? He's going to write a piece about unidentified flying objects. Are you serious? Life was given clearance by the Air Force Commanding General. How come? When the general staff makes a plan, they have the whole picture in view. We here at Dayton see only a smaller section. Pentagon has its reasons. Very good ones, most likely. When the life story breaks, we're going to have to fight our way in here through a milling mob of inquisitive reporters. No, Al, you won't. You won't be here. Colonel Searles in the Pentagon has requested you by name. He wants you to join his staff in Washington. Colonel, it's been swell working with you. But under the circumstances, I'll be delighted to get out of here. Upon my arrival in Washington, I was assigned to Air Force Press Desk, room 2E765 in the Pentagon. My last official act at AMC had been to arrange the conferences and briefings for Life magazine. I was in Washington only a short time when Look magazine submitted the galley proofs of their saucer article to my desk. I put the Look article through to security review. Now I felt free to settle down in my new job. I checked in with the press section of the United States Senate House of Representatives and Department of State. I paid the required visits to the information departments of the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. 
I covered the Civil Aeronautics Administration and other agencies with whom I would be working in close contact. By now, I figured I was through with flying saucers for good. But the Pentagon had other ideas. Because of my previous experience, I was assigned to unidentified flying objects. I was back in the flying saucer business. In the activity of setting up housekeeping and getting adjusted to the new job, I completely forgot about the Life magazine article. Also, I was able to spend more time with Chip. My son had been deaf in one ear since infancy, and it was difficult for him to play with other children. I had settled down to a regulated home life, but it was only a lull before the storm. April 7th, 1952, life hit the newsstands with the saucer story. The question, if anyone ever had any doubt about it, was forcefully answered. The public. America as a whole had an intense, avid interest in the subject of flying saucers. The first few days following the life story were chaotic. Naturally, my desk was an exposed point, and I was under an incessant barrage by newsmen. Shortly after the life story, looks coverage of saucers hit the newsstand. Their story featured a saucer map, including a statement by the commanding general, U.S. Air Force, Hoyt Vandenberg. Vandenberg stated, the Air Force is interested in anything that takes place in the air. This includes the aerial phenomenon commonly known as flying saucers. Many of these incidents have been satisfactorily explained. Others have not. Project Grudge was expanded and augmented. The classified name Grudge was dropped. The new code name for the UFO investigative project was Blue Book. The general appointed Captain Edward J. Ruppelt of ATIC at Wright-Patterson as officer in charge of Project Blue Book. Ruppelt's department was designated as Air Phenomenon Branch Air Technical Intelligence. At Ruppelt's disposal was a large staff of distinguished scientists, both military and civilian. One day, Major Dewey Fournay of Current Intelligence Branch sent for me. Will you come in here a minute, Al? Major Fournay was intelligence technical analyst and UFO monitor. Thanks, Captain. Al, I just got a call from Captain Ruppelt. A Navy photographer named Newhouse has made a sighting near Tremont, Utah. He got some UFOs on film. Motion pictures? Motion pictures. This film should prove interesting on a comparative basis. Comparative with what? With the Montana film. ATIC's had it for some time over at Dayton. You mean ATIC has had motion pictures? Why wasn't I told about it? You're being told about it now. Can I see these films? Ruppelt has a Newhouse film. It's back at Dayton being processed and analyzed. But I can show you the Montana film. This film was shot August the 15th, 1950. It was taken in Great Falls, Montana by Nick Mariana. Immediately after we were notified of the sighting, we sent an intelligence man to get a first-hand report. My name is Nick Mariana. For the past six years, I've been the general manager of a minor league baseball club called the Electrics. We play out of Great Falls, Montana, and are a farm club of the Brooklyn Dodgers. On August 15, 1950, at Legion Ballpark in Great Falls, Montana, after a couple of hours in the clubhouse office, I went up into the grandstand to call the groundskeeper. As I reached the top of the stairway, I glanced northward to the tall Anaconda Copper Company smokestack to check the direction of the wind from the white smoke. Force of habit, I suppose, because our outfielders use it as an indicator on defensive play. As I looked up, I saw two silvery objects moving swiftly out of the northwest. They appeared to be moving directly south. The objects were very bright and about 10,000 feet in the air. They appeared to be of a bright, shiny metal, like polished silver. Both were the same size and were traveling at the same rate of speed, which was much slower than the jets which shot by shortly after I filmed the discs. Suddenly, they stopped. It was then I remembered the camera in the glove compartment of my car. I raced downstairs, yelling for my secretary, Miss Virginia Ronnie. 
The distance from the top of the stairway to my car is about 60 feet, and I must have made that in about six jumps. I asked my secretary if she saw anything, and she said, yes, two silvery spheres. I unlocked the glove compartment of my car, took out the camera, turned the telephoto lens on the turret into position, set the camera at F-22, picked up the objects in the viewfinder, and pressed the trigger. The disks appeared to be spinning like a top and were about 50 feet across and about 50 yards apart. I could not see any exhaust, wings, or any kind of fuselage. There was no cabin, no odor, no sound, except I thought I heard a whooshing sound when I first saw them. As the film clicked through the camera, I could see the objects moving southeast behind the General Mills grain building and the black water tank directly south of the ballpark. I filmed the objects until they disappeared into the blue sky behind the water tank. There's only a few feet of film. It'll be over practically before your eyes are focused on it. Now remember, there's only a few feet of film, so watch closely. I still had my doubts, but I must admit I felt an excitement about seeing actual motion pictures of unidentified flying objects for the first time. Ready? Ready. You saw what I saw. What's your opinion? I'll run it again. Transcript on Mariana? It's at Dayton. Good. Colonel Searles wants me to go to Dayton. That is, if you'll give me clearance. I'll have you cleared. It's a good idea for you to get acquainted with the history of UFOs. When you get to Dayton, you'll meet Captain Rupelt. The three of us are going to be working closely from here on. Rupelt will give you a complete briefing on Blue Book. What's the story on him? Rupelt's an aeronautical engineer. He knows about things that fly. An excellent man to head up Project Blue Book. Okay. Once again, what's your opinion of this film? As far as I'm concerned, I'll have to classify them as unknowns. I'll run the film again, this time in slow motion. This time I strain my eyes to study the film. The Air Force analysts, by measuring the angular velocity of the objects and by computing their speed, had determined that they were not balloons. something up there in that sky. And if they were not balloons, I don't know what to think. You better get going to Dayton. Yes, sir, may I help you? I'll chop to see Captain Rupelt. Captain's right over there, sir. Thanks. Captain Rupelt, I'm Al Chop. Have a seat, sir. Major Fernand alerted me you're arriving. You've got the green light here. Where would you like to start? As a springboard, I suggested that he brief me on the general outline of how the organization handled reports on UFOs. Rupelt began to fill me in on the baffling saucer problem, including a breakdown on the reported sightings supplemented by graphs. There were literally hundreds of cases where Air Defense Command pilots had attempted to intercept UFOs. There were sightings where UFOs had been tracked by ground radar, airborne radar, ground observation, 
and combinations of all these elements. I accompanied intelligence officers on investigations. I witnessed the difficulty in breaking down and gaining the confidence of those who were reluctant to talk about their experiences for fear of personal ridicule and embarrassment. Others were cooperative. I observed the technique of thorough interrogation used by Blue Book's analysis and investigative staff. In almost every case, I heard the same words used to describe the sighting. These words were lights and metallic objects. There were reports by reliable, competent observers, including high-ranking Air Force and Navy flyers, civil engineers, and scientists. I learned that the staggering total of over 3,500 reports had been received. Quite a few of these sightings are unsolved. Approximately 85% of the sightings are designated as solved. According to this document, 14.3% of all sightings are officially designated as unknown. The newsmen keep hitting me with the unsolved cases. Anyway, solved is a big word. How do you solve them? There's nothing hit or miss about it. I'll show you. On December 1st, 1952, between 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning, several major airports in this area report a single round object. It was flashing, first white, then white-orange, then amber. It was observed northwest of this central point at an angle of 15 degrees above the horizon. Remember that 15 degrees. It's important. Reports arrived here from Teterboro Airport, Westchester Airport, Newark Airport, LaGuardia Airfield, Idlewild, and Mitchell Field. This flashing sphere of light was also observed by an Eastern Airline pilot who radioed in his report. Various observers at all these airports watched the object through high-power binoculars. When the report arrived here, we checked the weather in that area with Air Force Weather Bureau. That night, at that time, there was no temperature inversion. We got in touch with Navy Balloon Project Center at the University of Minnesota. That gave us an exact schedule of balloons released from that center. We got similar information from every other point where weather balloons are released through Air Force Balloon Plotting Center at Lowry Field, Denver. We contacted Air Force Weather for wind conditions and velocity at the altitude of known balloons. A precise computation of balloons in the air and known wind conditions definitely removed balloons from the picture. We checked with flight service to determine if any aircraft were in the vicinity on the bearing at that time. There were no aircraft. And still this thing was up there all the time, being observed by various personnel from airfields all over that area? Correct, and they were seeing it. We checked with our contract astronomer at a leading university in the locality and gave the astronomer the angle of elevation and bearing of the object. Remember, the object was observed at an angle of 15 degrees above the horizon, and I told you that was important. It proved to be the conclusive factor. Our astronomer reported that at the time of the observation, the planet Jupiter was 15 degrees above the horizon, and on the angle of elevation and bearing of the object, there's no doubt about it. What all these people saw was Jupiter. What made the light flash? Atmospheric conditions. The same conditions that make the stars appear to twinkle. You people really go into these things. We try. In over 80% of the cases, we come up with the correct answers. We don't get the correct answers in all the cases. What about the motion picture made by this Navy man, Newhouse? We're working on that. How does it look? Impressive. Can I see it? It's being analyzed. When the film is available, will I be able to take a look at it? As soon as analysis is completed, you'll see it. Satisfied? Yeah. How long will that take? About a week. We're doing an exhaustive check on the new house stuff. Really putting it through the ringer. When we're through, we'll forward a print to the director of intelligence with a complete report of our analysis. Fill me in on new house. Would you consider him a qualified observer? He rates as a top flight observer, an extremely competent one. Immediately upon getting word of his sighting, he dispatched an investigator from Travis Air Force Base to interrogate Newhouse. The exact date of his sighting was July 2nd at 11 a.m., Mountain Standard Time. I was driving on U.S. Highway 30 South with my wife and our son Delbert and our daughter Ann. We were on our way from Washington, D.C. to Portland, Oregon on vacation. Before reporting to my new duty station, at the Aviation Supply Depot, Naval Supply Center, Oakland, California. About seven miles after we passed through Tremont in Utah, my wife noticed a group of objects in the sky which she could not identify. I pulled over to the side of the road 
stopped, got out, looked up and saw the objects. There were about 12 of them in a rough formation proceeding in a westerly direction. They were like nothing I'd ever seen before, although I've logged some 2,000 hours in the air. They were identical in appearance. How would you describe these objects? Like two saucers, one inverted over the other. I had no means of judging the altitude. They appeared to me to be about the size of B-29s at 10,000 feet. Did you photograph them immediately? I watched the objects for a few moments before getting my camera out of the suitcase. Then I lost more time getting film out of the second suitcase and loading the camera. When I first saw the objects, they were almost overhead. By the time I had the camera ready to go, they had moved to a considerably greater distance. What kind of a camera did you use? A 16 millimeter Bell & Howell, a film auto load master with the three lens turret. I selected a three inch lens and set it on F8 and focused at infinity. Did you think of using slow motion? No, the camera was set on 16 frames per second, and in the excitement of the moment, I didn't think to shoot at a greater rate, although that would have improved the coverage. I centered the viewfinder on the objects and made the first shot. Then I decided that if the sky were darker, the objects would show better. So I stopped the lens down to F16 and continued photographing. This proved to be a mistake as the quality of the film would have been better had I left it at F8. Did these objects remain together in a group at all times? No, toward the end, one object reversed its course and proceeded away from the uh, rest of the group. I held the camera still and allowed this single object to pass through the field of view, picking it up again later in its course. Did this single object return to the rest of the group? No, I allowed it to pass through the field of view of the camera two or three times and then it disappeared. In what direction? Over the eastern horizon. What did you do then? I turned swinging the camera just in time to see the rest of the group disappear over the western horizon. What was the weather? The weather was bright and cloudless. Visibility good? The visibility was excellent. How does this film you shot compare with what you saw with your naked eye? You have studied the film. Yes, I've studied it. I'm very disappointed. The film falls far short of showing what I saw with the naked eye due to the delay in getting the camera started and my error and exposure. If I'd had this camera in the seat beside me, loaded and ready to go, there'd be no need for questions. The Air Force would have the answer. What is your full name, please? Delbert Clement Newhouse. And you are on active duty with the Navy? Yes, sir, I am. What is your official Navy rank? My title is Chief Photographer. I'm a commissioned warrant officer, United States Navy. How long have you been in the service? 21 years. Now, is there anything you can add to the description of these objects? They had a bright silvery color. Can you describe some particular detail? They had a metallic appearance. They seemed to be made of some kind of polished metal. The Newhouse film, as I told you, is presently under analysis. Sergeant, would you get me the Fargo case? The Fargo sighting was October 1st, 1948. A National Guard lieutenant, thank you, a National Guard lieutenant was about to land his F-51 at Fargo Airport. Captain Ruppelt gave me the details from the record. The pilot, after a routine patrol flight, was cleared by the tower to land when he asked... Anything in the way? There's a Piper Cub below you. Nothing else in the air. I see the Piper Cub. I see another light about a thousand yards ahead of me. It looks like the tail light of a plane. I can see you, but I can't see the light you're observing. The pilot told the tower he could see it and was going to close in and try to make identification. I can see it clearly now, a small white light. It keeps blinking on and off. As he approached it, the blinking light became clear and steady. Suddenly, it pulled into a sharp left bank. I think this thing is going to make a pass on the tower. I see it now. I see it. The pilot dived on the light 
And although he brought his manifold pressure up to 60 inches, he reported, I can't seem to catch up with the thing. It's gaining altitude and it's just made an impossible turn. A 90 degree turn to the left. You're right. It's gaining altitude on you. And it's still in a very tight left turn. By that time, they were at 7,000 feet, when, suddenly, the light made a 90-degree right turn. It's headed straight at me. The light passed directly over your canopy at, I estimate, about 500 feet. The object suddenly shot straight into the air. The pilot followed it to 14,000 feet when his plane went into a power stall. The object disappeared. The chase had lasted approximately 27 minutes. The officer in the tower was the airport traffic controller. The lieutenant was an instructor for the French during the Second World War. He said he was sure there was an intelligence behind the movements of the lights. He stated, too, that no earthborne pilot could have withstood the G-factor inherent in the object's turns and speed without blacking out. Was there radar at the field? No, there wasn't. Too bad. Radar would have made it airtight. Not necessarily. I thought a radar return was indisputable evidence. No, it isn't. Are you a radar expert? No, I'm not, but I have one on tap. Give me extension 361. We have a team of three radar analysts here in Air Phenomenon Branch. I want to talk to Wynn Swanson. All radar reports received here pass through this radar analysis division. Swanson, I have a man here from the Pentagon. He's cleared, wants to know about radar. Mm-hmm, okay. Field socked in solid with fog, but he'll take you over to GCA. This is ground control approach. With zero visibility, GCA picks up the aircraft coming in and by means of the pips on their scope, can talk them into a landing. Now this scope here gives the aircraft in the area. This scope here tells you whether you're the right or the left of the landing strip, and that one there tells you whether you're too high or too low. Now, the next scope is the same as this one, except that it gives you more accuracy. Patterson, GCA. This is Air Force 2162, past Fairfield, fan marker inbound. Request landing instructions. There you can see him on the screen. And you can track him all the way in. He's flying blind. Steer right to heading 20 degrees and begin descent to 1,500 feet. This is Air Force 162, steering 20 degrees, descending to 1,500. Over. Air Force 162, the weather at Patterson Field is 100 feet ragged ceiling. Visibility, one half mile, light rain. Wind, southwest, six. Altimeter, 998. If you can see it on radar, there can be no question about misinterpretation. In this case, no, these are good solid blips. This is Air Force 162, roger on the weather and runway, over. Air Force 162, steer left to heading 35, turning downwind leg, range 8 miles south, over. This is Air Force 162, steering 35, over. Sometimes a temperature inversion will cause trouble. Ionized clouds or equipment malfunction will cause false blips. Can you tell a false blip from one made by aircraft? Yes, any experienced operator can tell in a minute or so. Air Force 162, steer left to heading 215. This will put you on final approach. This is Air Force 162, roger. Steering 215, over. Air Force 162, this is your final director. How do you read me? Over. This is Air Force 162. You are loud and clear. Over. Air Force 162, Roger. Your range is seven miles. Slow aircraft to descending speed. Make final flap setting. Maintain altitude of 1,200. Heading 215. Do not acknowledge any further transmission unless unable to comply. If you do not hear GCA for any five second interval, Climb to 1,000 feet on a heading of 125 and contact approach control. Steer right to heading 210, range 5 miles. You are now approaching glide path. 
Start normal rate of descent at 600 feet per minute. Entry to glide path good. Steer left to heading 212. Range 4 miles. Go above glide path 10, 15, 25 feet high. Increase your rate of descent slightly. Heading 212. Holding you on the center line. Holding two feet high on glide path. Check that descent. Steer right to heading of 213. Range now three miles. Holding glide path very well. Go below glide path. 10, 20, 30 feet. Level off slightly. Steer right to heading 214. Coming back nicely to glide path. 25, 20, 15 feet low. Heading 214 had you lined up with the center line. Range, two miles. Holding 15 feet low on the glide path. Bring it up slightly. 10, five. Now on glide path. Range, one and a half miles. Heading 214 on glide path. Steer left to heading 213. Over the end of runway on center line. On glide path as you approach point of touchdown. Touchdown in three seconds. If you cannot see the runway, pull up and climb to 1,000 feet, heading 125. your job here, Swanson? I'm one of a group of three radar specialists employed by the Air Force. Reports of radar contacts of unidentified objects are sent in to us from all over the world for analysis. How long have you been in Air Force intelligence? Two years. Ever come across any cases you couldn't solve? We have unsolved cases, yes. Cases where good solid blips appeared and no known objects in the area. Then, too, we have cases of fantastic speed. Exactly what do you mean by fantastic speed? I mean speeds greater than any achieved by man. How much greater? Thousands of miles per hour. Thousands of miles? What's your idea of what they are? All I can say is unknown. You must remember that I have been restricted to only radar contacts. I have no experience with visual contacts. What do you think about the chances of these objects having intelligence behind their control? All I can say is I have an open mind. What do you think about the theory of interplanetary source? I have an open mind, period. I spent a full week in Dayton. I had hoped to see the new house film before returning to Washington, but it was still under analysis by the Wright Field Photo Lab. When the analysis was completed, the film was taken by an Air Force courier and hand carried to Washington to be viewed by the Director General of Air Force Intelligence. Here it is. All set, Major? Yes, sir. Air Technical Intelligence has reported that this film could not be produced under simulated conditions. Let's go. There'll be several feet of blank film before the pictures come on. The film, as Newhouse had predicted, was in bad condition, but the chief interest was in movement, speed, and light source. 
After a moment, the general asked to see it again. were the only words spoken in the room. How about that? A few days later, Major Fournay had some news for me. We got the analysis of the new house film from Air Material Command. What does it show? Not birds, not balloons, not aircraft, not faked. With a telephoto lens used, weather balloons within five miles distance could have been determined on the film. At a greater distance than five miles, they could not attain the speeds calculated. Within a five mile range, an aircraft of 40 foot wingspan could have been clearly determined. In excess of five miles, the speeds of the objects are greater than aircraft could achieve, except in a straight line speed run. No bird is sufficiently reflective as to cause the film to react as strongly as it is done. If they're not birds, not balloons, or aircraft, and the film isn't faked, what can these things be? The official conclusion is unknowns. The new house film was only the overture. A few minutes before 1 a.m., July 20th, 1952, the curtain on the first act of the Washington drama went up. The unknowns moved in for the first time over the national capital. I had always regarded myself as a man with an intuitive nose for news. So, through the first Washington sighting, while the saucers hovered over the city, I was in bed, sleeping soundly through it all. When I reached my desk that morning, we were flooded with newspaper queries. Telephones were jangling throughout the day. Irate editors from all over the country were insistently demanding more specific information. Newsmen from the wire services, reporters from local and out-of-town newspapers were hemming me in, belaboring me with questions for which I had no answers. For the first couple of hours, we at the press desk had a terrible time getting the story straight ourselves. But bit by bit, I managed to piece it together. There had been both visual and radar contacts. Andrews Field, the Air Force installation, had radar returns similar to those on the CAA radar. Jets had been scrambled in an attempt to make an intercept of the UFOs, but they had not been successful. The week after the Washington saucer sighting was a mad, chaotic one. The story was headlined from coast to coast. As the PIO man assigned to answer saucer questions, I had been under an incessant barrage of inquiries day and night by newsmen. I could get no sleep, no rest at all. Among other things, the Washington Daily News published an interview with Harry G. Barnes, Senior Air Traffic Controller, Civil Aeronautics Administration. Barnes stated, there is no other conclusion I can reach but that for six hours on the morning of the 20th of July, there were at least 10 unidentifiable objects moving above Washington. They were not ordinary aircraft. I could tell that by their movement on the scope. I can safely deduce that they perform gyrations which no known aircraft could perform. By this I mean that our scope showed that they could make right angle turns and complete reversals of flight nor, in my opinion, could any natural phenomena account for these spots on our radar. Then, exactly a week later, it really broke loose. It was the night of July 26, 1952. At 10.30 p.m., I received a phone call from Ray Nathan at CAA. Hello. Chop? Yeah. Ray Nathan, get down here right away. What's up? The radar at Washington National is picking up unknown. Again? The press is hounding me for a statement. I don't know what to tell him. Deep, bring my coat and the car keys. Stall them off. I'll be right over. A couple of guys from Life magazine are here with a camera. Stall them, too. What's the matter? 
Radar is picking up unknowns over the capital. Don't wait up. At 11.10 p.m., Major Forte received a call from Lieutenant Colonel Thomas, Air Force Intelligence duty officer at the Pentagon, informing him of what was going on at Washington National. As I raced to the airport, I kept glancing up through the windshield, expecting to see the things, but everything seemed normal. They tell us we need your okay to get into the radar room. You can't get in, boys. I'm sorry. We want some pictures of that scope, Al. You can't photograph the scope. Why not? It's under security measures. Classified wavelength, classified code names. Here we are in the biggest story in history, and you're keeping us out. Sorry, but that's the way it's got to be. Then we're going over your head, Al. Colonel Dick Searles. You can reach him at Metropolitan 89898. Look at him go. One of them is an airline. It's a slightly different shape. Did you alert the Air Force? I called Air Defense Command. What'd they say? They're scrambling a couple of jets. Same as last week? Uh-huh. Could this be caused by temperature inversion? Inversion? That is an inversion, and it's different than the ground clutter we pick up. Did you call the Air Force Command post at Pentagon? No, we work through Filter Center. I'd better call them. Get me the Pentagon Air Force Command Post. This is Al Chop. I'm at Washington National. Have you heard about the unknowns here tonight? We've been alerted. There's a blue flight on the way there right now. Okay. Washington Control to Flight 639, come in. Flight 639 to Washington Control, over. Washington Control to Flight 639. You're approaching traffic on your left. Can you see it? Over. Andrews Tower to Washington Control. We show an unknown just to the left of Flight 639. Flight 639 to Washington Control. We can see that traffic on our left. Over. Washington Control to Flight 639. What does the traffic look like? Over. Flight 639 to Washington Control. It's a light, a blue-green light, over. Washington Control to Flight 639. Can you make out what type of craft it is? Over. Flight 639 to Washington Control, no. We can just see a light, a blue-green light, over. Washington Control to Flight 639, roger, out. This is Bluebird 1 to Washington Control, come in. The jets are coming on now. Washington Control to Bluebird 1. Change course to 225 degrees. Bluebird 2, hold your course. Over. Bluebird 1 to Washington Control. Wilco, out. Bluebird 2 to Washington Control. Wilco, out. They're gone. Andrews Tower to Washington Control. All our unknowns vanished shortly after the jets appeared. Do you still have any of the unknowns? Over. Washington Control to Andrews Tower. The same thing happened here. Out. Washington Control to Bluebird 1. All the unknowns had disappeared. You say those returns are the same as those you got last week? The same as last week. At this point, Major Fournay arrived with a Navy electronics intelligence officer. Gone? Like that. As soon as the jets came on the scope, the unknowns left. Bluebird 1 to Washington Control. We're going back to the base and refuel. Can't see anything around up here. Visibility is good. Over. Washington Control to Bluebird 1. Roger. Out. Were they good returns? Good returns. Has the set been checked for malfunctions? The radar equipment is in perfect operating order. They're back. Andrews Tower to Washington Control. They're back. Just as the jets left our scope. They dropped back in again out of nowhere. You got them? Over. Those blips are solid. They're good and solid. Washington Control to Andrews Tower. Same thing happened here. 
Give me the Pentagon command post. They're all over the scope. Two in the northeast quadrant, four in southeast quadrant, three in southwest quadrant, three in northwest quadrant. Over. This is Major Fournay calling from Washington Control. Radar is picking up 14 unknowns again. The chief controller tells me the unknowns disappeared from the scope as soon as the jets came in and were picked up again when the jets left. The Navy electronics intelligence officer confirms that the unknown blips are good and solid. I recommend a couple of more jets be sent up immediately to investigate. Yes, sir. Andrews Tower to Washington Control. That's the way we had them. One just moved from the northwest quadrant into the southeast quadrant. It stopped over the White House. They're scrambling a couple of more jets. Washington Control to Andrews Tower. Roger on the change. Now it's moving back. Do you get it? Over. It's back in the northwest quadrant. Over. Washington Control to Andrews Tower. Roger. We've got a scramble out. What are those? Slight temperature inversion. You can see the difference in the returns. One strong, the other weak. These unknowns are solid objects. Red Dog 1 to Washington Control. We're approaching the area. Over. Washington Control to Red Dog 2. Change course to 265 degrees. Washington Control to Red Dog 1. Change course to 114 degrees. Over. Red Dog 1 to Washington Control. Wilco, out. About 4.30 a.m., Major Fournay received a long-distance telephone call from Robert Gina of Life magazine. He wanted permission for his people to interview the pilots of the first scramble at Newcastle. Major Fournay decided that under the circumstances, it would be wise for him to take the call. Washington Control to Red Dog 1. Change course to 315 degrees. Over. Red Dog 1 to Washington Control. Wilco, out. Washington Control to Red Dog 1. Come in. Red Dog 1 to Washington Control. Over. Andrews Tower to Washington Control. Our scope shows Red Dog 1 is right in the middle of the unknowns. Washington Control to Red Dog 1. Can you see anything on either side or to the front of you? Over. Red Dog 1 to Washington Control. Can't see anything. Wait a minute. I see him. Yeah, I see him. Sir. Maximum speed. They're going away. They're gone. I can't see them. Dog one to Washington Control. I've been given permission to return to base. Over. Washington Control to Red Dog One. Roger. Out. At 6 a.m. that same morning, I called Lieutenant William Patterson, the pilot of Red Dog One, who had made visual contact with the unknowns. He could add nothing more to what he had reported to us over the intercom. 
Later that same morning, the White House placed a call to the Pentagon. Captain Rupelt, who had flown in from Wright-Patterson and who was only beginning his analysis of the sighting, got the call from the White House. Yes, sir. It appears to have been caused by temperature inversion. Yes, sir. We've had cases where radar blips have been caused by temperature inversion. This was Captain Rupelt's report to President Truman. But Captain Rupelt had not been present at the Washington sighting. It wasn't until later that he learned there had been both visual and radar contact with the unknowns on that night. On Monday morning, an avalanche of calls from newspapers throughout the nation jammed the trunk lines at the Pentagon. The relentless pressure continued. We admitted radar contacts from the three surrounding airfields. When did the saucers first appear? 9 p.m. How long were they under observation? Six hours. How many were there? 14. Could the pilots see any details? No. In an interview which appeared in the Washington Times Herald, Lieutenant Patterson, pilot of Red Dog One, said he concentrated on one of the bright lights, but it outran him. I tried to make contact with the bogies below 1,000 feet, Patterson said. I saw several bright lights. I chased a single bright light. I was at my maximum speed. I ceased chasing it because I saw no chance of overtaking it. Under the insistent demands from the nation's press and the accumulating pressure of the public, the chief of staff set up a press conference at the Pentagon. I was present when General Sanford spoke for the newsreel cameras. Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them, explain them to our own satisfaction. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena, or as light aberration. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage. And that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. When I left the Pentagon that evening, General Sanford's words kept running through my mind. Credible observers of relatively incredible things. The theories of the skeptics could not stand up to the actual experiences of high-ranking military personnel, radar experts, airline pilots, and other responsible witnesses referred to by General Sanford as credible observers. I started to walk through the streets of Washington, the words remaining with me, credible observers of relatively incredible things. I recalled when I first joined the project at AMC, how I regarded with disbelief the whole subject of flying saucers. But piece by piece, the evidence had crystallized. Until now, in my opinion, there was no doubt as to their existence. Now, so far as I was concerned, it was no longer a question of whether or not there were unknown objects flying in our atmosphere. For me, the only questions that remained were, what are these objects? Where do they come from? 
To me, the evidence indicated intelligence behind their control. And by now, the belief that their source was interplanetary was no longer incredible. This is the Montana film, projected exactly as it was photographed. The objects are moving against a 25 to 28 mile an hour wind. This is the film in double frame or slow motion. A slight bounce in the movement of the objects as well as the tower is perceptible. This is due to the handheld camera. The film, analyzed frame by frame, shows the movement of the objects to be horizontal and steady. We will now vary the action and size of the objects and also stop the action from time to time for your study. We have just made a jump cut in the film to an enlarged size and reversed the action. You are now seeing the objects exactly as they were photographed, but from a closer perspective. Analysis reveals that the objects are not balloons, nor any kind of known aircraft. The images are very different from those produced by any kind of birds at any distance. The shape, brightness, speed, rectilinear path, steady motion, and separation rule out various forms of optical atmospheric mirages or cloud reflections. Comprehensive analysis has eliminated meteors and other known natural phenomena. The possibility of airplane reflection has been carefully studied and ruled out. This is the Utah film as it was originally photographed. The image structure and maneuvers definitely eliminate any kind of known aircraft. This is where Chief Photographer Newhouse, in his excitement, changed exposure. He believed that by changing density and giving the film more contrast, he could clarify the objects. The single object that reversed its course. The bounce is due to handheld camera. Now we study the action of one section of the film. We stop the action. We move in. Within a five mile range, aircraft could be determined. In excess of five miles, the speeds are greater than aircraft can achieve, except in straight line speed runs. The movement here follows an elliptical or circular pattern. Microscopic examination reveals that the objects are well focused. Their size varies from one sixth to one tenth the size of the moon as it appears to the naked eye. Their form is circular and sometimes elliptical. This fits the commonly used flying saucer description. 
Observe the object in the upper left corner. We move in to study the action. The object upper left will go out of frame on widescreen projection. Observe the motion of the two objects upper right as we rock them back and forth. Now we move over and up on the frame to make a closer study of the object in the upper left corner. Examine this object closely. Compare it with those objects you saw in the Montana film. These films were taken approximately two years apart, hundreds of miles apart. We drop back to the original perspective and resume. Now the section of the film where photographer Newhouse changed exposure. Weather conditions together with the persistence and motion of the formations eliminate the possibility of atmospheric mirages. Photogrammetric experiments have shown that the images cannot be associated with any kind of birds at any distance. Stop. Now forward again. Stop. We drop back to original perspective. Now once again and for the last time, the Utah film. The objects cannot be associated with any known balloon observations. For the last time, the Montana film. The motion picture you have just seen is authentic. It is substantiated by documentation, eyewitness accounts supported by affidavits, and official government reports. The evidence has been presented to you with integrity and objectivity to establish the fact that unidentified flying objects, commonly known as flying saucers, do exist. Some kind of flying objects have been photographed in the sky. If they cannot be identified as objects known to man, what are they? If they are not man-made, who made them? If they are not from this planet, where are they from?